I'm here today to talk about um, a subject that's relatively new to me, which is the subject of energy. Uh, I've had a history of working on the environment and a deep interest in environmental issues, um, but really had never had an opportunity to, to think about energy and this nexus of energy in the environment and where we are you know, in the global economy. We can't have prosperity and economic opportunity without energy, or at least we haven't figured out a way yet. Um, and I'd also like to tell a story that's about the environment, um, which uh, I think is not something that we can treat in a separate bucket, but we have to start to see how economic opportunity and energy and the environment you know, come together. So we, we set out to develop a, a strategy, a plan for what to do. Uh, and I kind of, as I think back to that, you know, effort to create a strategy for America, uh, just think about the presidential election that's going on in our country right now. Think about the disconnect between a strategy for America and that, and that presidential election. But, any, but anyway, we, we, we came out with, uh, we, we, we developed this plan. And these seven things that you see on this, on this, uh, on this slide were things that Washington needed to do. There are lots of things that needed to happen at the state and regional level, but Washington needed to tackle some of the big issues, our tax code, our, uh, our uh, immigration system. Uh, uh, in, in many of these areas, Canada has actually done some really great work. Uh, I'm very jealous of the whole immigration environment here in Canada. I think it's very, very well done and, and very pro-competitive. Uh, you know, we're still, you know, nowhere on these issues. So why were we so concerned? Well, the answer is that we've been having a war <laughs> about this incredible economic act opportunity, a, a war among ourselves uh, in America. Uh, this is just some of the, you know, evolution of, of public opinion about fracking. In America, fracking is kind of a swear word. It's a swear word. This is the biggest economic opportunity we've seen in a long time, but the core technology is a swear word. That's the way it's being portrayed. Um, not only that, and that's because there are a lot of local environmental concerns about, you know, does this cause earthquakes, does it pollute the water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In addition, there has been a tremendous debate about climate. Is this energy opportunity that we have, is our low-cost energy resource, you know, really bad or inconsistent or incompatible with climate change and, and our response to climate change? And many have taken the point of view Yes, you know, fossil fuel is just bad. And we're going to do everything we can to stop it, all of it. Uh, and we've had a lot of efforts. You know, a lot of this pipeline stuff that goes on is really not about pipeline. It's about fossil fuel. And pipeline is the most pragmatic way to stop the bus on, on fossil fuel. And, uh, they, you know, there have been lots of bans, of, of, of production bans in, in, in a variety of places like New York State. So here we have this juxtaposition of a tremendous economic opportunity in, a, in an economy that desperately needs greater opportunities for improving the standard of living for the average citizen. And yet we have this war, this extreme polarization. And uh, what's, what's been playing itself out in the U.S. is a truly um, unproductive discourse. You know, we've had industries sort of in denial. Oh, the, the environmentalist says, well, you know, you know, you're causing earthquakes. And the industry, no, no, that's not us. Uh, environmentalists say, well, there's water pollution issues or, or, or water, water use issues. And the industry says, oh, no, there's no evidence that that's a problem. So we've kind of had, industry has sort of been in denial. 
a lot of people in the industry have viewed this as kind of a mortal threat. That is, this is going to put us out of business. That's the way we look at it. We've got to acknowledge these issues if we're going to make any progress. And that applies to climate as well. We've got, we got to acknowledge the issue. In America, just like in Canada, the public has voted. The public believes that we need to do something about climate change, overwhelmingly. And the longer we don't, the, the, the less credibility and the less respect and the less support that the industry will have uh, you know, forever. Um, you know, second thing uh, we have come to understand, though, is despite the fact that there are legitimate problems and, and that we can measure them and track them and look at them, there's been a huge amount of progress. You know, some of you that know my environmental work uh, know that one of the core ideas that came out of that work was the idea that actually improving environmental performance isn't inconsistent with improving economic performance. There's been some myths about the relationship between climate and economics. Uh, you know, myth number one, that, that if we put in climate legislation, that will kill off the unconventional energy. Um, and the answer is, actually, it won't. Um, we actually need natural gas in particular to implement the climate legislation. If we really want to move the needle over the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to need gas in particular. Gas is really a strategic resource in climate improvement. Uh, and uh, we also know that uh, for natural gas, at least in America, based on our data, 70% of all the natural gas isn't even is not used for power. You know, it's used to make plastics and other stuff. It's a feedstock. Uh, and the feedstock uses are not environmentally um, an issue at all. So the idea that we should, you know, kind of try to, uh, you know, that unconventionals will go away is simply not right. Myth number two, uh, if, we, if we do anything to mitigate climate change, it's going to tank our economy and make us uncompetitive. Well, that's not true either. And we've got a lot of data that you can read about in our report that show that actually because we have the natural gas as a bridge and because we have the very competitive energy resource opportunity that I talked about earlier, we can actually move along the climate agenda very, very uh, substantially uh, at really no extra cost because we have that unconventional resource and because we have that low cost position. Uh, myth number three is that somehow unconventionals will kill off renewables. We hear this a lot. If we develop this natural gas, this fossil fuel stuff, then that's going to stop renewables in their tracks. Well, again, the answer is no, it won't. If you look at the real data on renewables, renewables are on a very positive trajectory. Renewables are more competitive today than we thought they would be even two or three years ago. Really competitive. The lines are going to cross. They, it's just a matter of time, and it's not a long time. Renewables are making rapid advances in fundamental efficiency. In fact, in the long run, they will be the efficient energy source. There'll be no trade-off with efficiency to go to renewables at all. Now, to get there, it's, you know, we're still on that path. The, trouble, the, the challenge with renewables is they, you know, the sun doesn't shine all day and the wind doesn't blow all the time. And different regions have different resources. And so that creates a complexity about renewables that I think many people don't understand. And uh, the requirements for a whole new grid infrastructure and all kinds of policies that need to be in place. And the final myth is that is the so-called lock-in effect. If we allow even one fossil fuel power plant to be built, even if it's gas, then that fossil fuel plant will be around forever and will never get rid of that stuff. That's another argument that we hear a lot. And again, 
that's, that's very easy to think if you're never worked in a company and you don't understand useful life and you don't understand how uh, you know, uh, uh, cycles of proper, uh, plant replacement work. But if you actually do the math, which uh, with the help of BCG and, and, and Greg, we've done, it turns out that w it, you know, once renewables get to a substantial penetration, there'll be plenty of gas-fired power plants that will be ready for retirement. Uh, and there really is no lock-in. We see a kind of a, a turning point forming in industry, even at this time of great stress you know, in, in the energy industry in, in North America. Uh, we see uh, the, some of the environmentalist discussion improving. Uh, we see people now starting to work on solutions. But it took a long, long time. We spent a long time avoiding solutions <laughs> and avoiding pragmatism and avoiding kind of how do we move forward. Uh, and now I think there's some hope that we're in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, a, in a pivot point uh, opportunity. Uh, the energy transformation is happening. We will move to a low carbon future. There's no doubt about that. Renewables will be competitive. There's no doubt about that now. Natural gas is a critical bridge fuel and an important potential competitive advantage to economies that have it at low cost in abundance. Uh, we know that. And, and this is something that, again, many have trouble accepting, and for certain segments of the energy space, we're going to need fossil fuels for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, for running airplanes, for example. Uh, there's just no way to get enough power, you know, uh, without fossil fuels that anybody's seen so far. Now, somebody may invent a way around that, but, but we're going to have to understand that niches of fossil fuels in carefully uh, understood applications where that is so much more cost-effective than any other way to do it are fine as long as we make uh, good progress on the broader agenda. Now, then now, now I think the time is come when I think I want to ask you the question in your mind, anyway, to think about is, what's the path that Canada is on here? You're part of this. You're part of this revolutionary opportunity. You know, Canada has these unique assets. And so there's really this North American advantage in energy. What will Canada's story be about how to move forward in taking advantage of this opportunity, but also recognizing the profound issues that we understand about climate? Uh, you know, will Canada spend the next 10 years like we did? Um, not getting anywhere? Uh, or will Canada be able to move this forward? And what's very, very exciting for me being here is I think you are already on a different path. And I'm hopeful that you could really get on a different path. And that you can lead us and establish a remarkable new reputation around the world. 